Thank you. Okay, so um, I should also thank the organizing committee of this conference for inviting me to speak. It's, I think, quite an honor to address a very uh, distinguished group of scientists. And also thank um, Fresh Root Group 3 for um, keep allowing me to come back and participate in the meeting. I certainly have um, gained a lot from my exposure to the, to the group. So um, there's uh, quite a number of people in my part of the world um, in the West Coast and in Alaska that are interested in this topic. And um, I listed two of the people here. Um, E.J. Dick is a fellow Rockford scientist. He works at, um, in California for the same agency as me. And uh, Martin Dorn um, works on the Polk assessment and provided one of the um, I, uh, assessments I use as a case study in my work for this talk. So there's um, a few different uh, uh, parts of my talk today, and here's just a brief outline. Um, I want to review, um, you know, somewhat briefly, um, some, uh, some complexity of the fishery production as kind of I see it from an assessment world and how it's uh, uh, simplified in our assessments. Um, I'll talk a bit about some mechanisms um, that we can use to incorporate some of these concepts into assessments and uh, have a couple of case studies. Um, I make a distinction here between assessment and, and management, and I'll have some thoughts on how we can incorporate some of these concepts into management as well as assessments, and finally can wrap up with some final thoughts and conclusions. So um, here's kind of my perhaps you know simple and naive uh, categorization of some of these concepts that we heard about this week. Um, the, the first category I, I can see is you know there's an issue of the proportion of the fish that spawn. So all of our assessments uh, typically have a maturity ogive, but it, uh, they usually don't account for things like skip spawning that we heard about this week. Um, a second category um, you might say is the quality of the um, SRP or the the reproductive potential or RP. Um, and so we heard about, about this week about uh, maternal effects. Um, and as Richard Nash pointed out earlier this week, um, you know, it's not so much the, the um, you know, the egg or larvae itself um, that you may have to look at, but also the, the uh, time and space of um, spawning or part tuition and whether that has a, an age or length uh, component to it as well in terms of the, the size and age of the spawner. Um, and then a third piece is the, the quantity of, of the output, just how much is, is produced. And particularly, I'm thinking about the, um, the idea of weight-specific quantity, you know, whether uh, fish of different sizes and different age produce more on a pre-unit basis than, um, than uh, fish of other sizes and ages. So um, this I want to mention, you know, pretty briefly. Um, I don't have any modeling work on this concept, although we can do that perhaps for the future. But um, uh, some people in the audience might be interested in kind of a West Coast example of this um, abortive maturation, you know, a, a type of skip spawning. This is from some data from Hannah and Parker for uh, Pacific Ocean Perch, or POP, off the Oregon coast. And um, we see this, this um, abortive maturation seems to be more prevalent when it occurs at the younger, um, um, younger ages and smaller sizes than it is at the, the uh, older and larger fish. Um, so anyway, this is a, kind of a West Coast uh, rockfish example of this um, type of process. And as I mentioned, this is maybe something to look at in, in the modeling in the future. Um, some things that we, you know, have looked at in terms of modeling, where I was really inspired by, um, or motivated, I should say, by some of Steve Brookie's work, and I've, I've, I think this is the first kind of fresh meeting where, you know, we've gone through the entire conference, and I've been the first one to show this plot. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the now famous plot by Steve Brookley is, is shown here, where he had black rock fish in the laboratory, and um, again, off the course of Oregon, and uh, uh, he noted that the, the quality of the, um, the protruded larvae of these black rockfish uh, diminished um, um, as the age and size of the spawner um, was either smaller or younger. Um, so uh, what I've done in, in my modeling work then is to try to take some of Berkeley's fitted curves and uh, um, estimate a, a, a survival curve for larvae based on the age of the spawner. And I've modified it a little bit because uh, Pacific Ocean perch, the stock I'm interested in, um, has a quite a bit longer lifespan than black rockfish, so I've kind of shifted the curve to the right. But, but another key point I want to make, um, if you study uh, Brickley's data, you know, somewhat, you can kind of see that there's a, a group of points down here where there's a clear drop-off after about age, you know, eight or nine. And then there's, there's three points up here where it actually looks more like a, kind of like a hockey stick sort of model. You know, and there's some kind of leveling off of, of these maternal effects. Um, so um, this sort of flat top nature of the of the curve has an important implication for some of the, the results we see later. And then finally, the, um, the work of E.J. Dick. E.J. Um, 
in 2009, completed his uh, dissertation, which is focused on, on um, uh, one of the things he looked at was this idea of, of weight specific fecundity for, for rockfish off the West Coast. Um, so we've heard this week that, you know, under the assumption of um, SSB, you know, we, um, we assume that, uh, that egg production is proportional to the weight of the spawner. So if, if that were true, then this exponent here, you know, should be, should be one. Um, and in this case, you can clear it's, it's not one. And it looks almost like a fecundity length plot instead of fecundity weight, but I think the units are right. Um, and the, um, part of the, you know, these really outlandish values here is, is a function of small sample sizes. You know, for any given rockfish stock off the West Coast, you may not have a lot of fecundity data. So what EJ did to kind of get around that was uh, construct a, um, a Bayesian hierarchical model and he had over, I think, 20 stocks of rockfish in his model. So there's, there's two parameters here, you know, this A and the B term. And because it's a, it's a Bayesian model, each parameter has a prior distribution that differs by species. And then the means and the variances of these uh, distributions by species are drawn from an overall hyper distribution. So, so the idea is that by estimating all the parameters at once, the, uh, the information from the data rich species can help inform the estimates for the data poor species. And this is the, the results that EJ found. So, each of the rows here is a, is a particular rock for species off the West Coast, and these, um, these uh, um, box plots kind of show a, a summary of the posterior distribution. So, you know, so the posterior medians are shown by these kind of solid lines, and, you know, they're uh, clearly above one. So there is some suggestion that, that um, this exponent is, is not only not one, but it's perhaps greater than one. We can also use this in a, you know, for data poor stocks, if we have a, a stock for which we don't know fecundity, you know, we could use the, the median from this posterior distribution as some information on what we might expect uh, to occur. So how has this uh, type of information been used in assessments? Um, I think on the West Coast, they, they're probably a bit more advanced than we are in Alaska, uh, probably because EJ is down there and they're all familiar with his work and, and his work does apply to the West Coast. You know, so of the 16 uh, rockfish that EJ cited in his dissertation, I think about half of them you know, define um, SRP in terms of eggs rather than SSB. Um, I don't think they go as far as actually using, um, you know, the, the estimates of FMSY and you know, constructing their, their spawn recruit curves um, in that sense, but they do uh, characterize depletion in, in these units. Um, and in Alaska, I, th I think we're, you know, we're still kind of using SSD paradigm, and I think part of the reason for that is we, did, we don't have a sort of an analog to EJ study that we can apply to Alaska fish. So when I think about incorporating these concepts into assessments, um, um, I think of as assessments as uh, consisting of at least you know, three tasks. You know, these, I think, are three critical tasks we do in assessments. Um, the first is we, we need to estimate the abundance of fish by age class. You know, so this is sort of, the, sort of the mechanics, the nuts and bolts, the, the statistical process of actually fitting models uh, to data. Um, the second thing we need to do is, um, I guess there's two parts. We need to estimate our, our reference points you know, both our fishing rate reference points in terms of target rates and, and limit rates, and also our, our reference points at which we would declare a stock to be overfished or not. Um, so gets, this gets into the de depletion idea. So the idea here is that and we often have these control rules that define our, our fishing management rates, and we need to kind of place our stock, um, you know, on that, on that um, control rule plot in terms of whether the stock is currently overfished or not, or you know, whether we are currently experiencing overfishing or not. So we uh, got a bit of a start on this a few years ago. Um, again, we were motivated by Steve Brookley's talk and um, wanted to see, you know, what the influence of maternal effects would be on our, on our rockfish stocks. And this is kind of done outside the assessment, but the analysis is really identical. Um, so what I'm showing here is um, two stocks of rockfish, the, um, my own Barron Sea Aleutian Islands uh, POP, and also the Gulf of Alaska POP down here. And, and um, each of the, um, colors then is a, is a yield curve with some different assumptions on this larval survival curve. So the green line is, uh, is simply SSB, so I'm assuming no maternal effects. The blue line is my modification of Berkeley's curve, and the red line is a rather extreme um, uh, survival rate, or it's, it's more kind of knife edge where it drops off very, very quickly. So what we saw in both cases is that the, the FMSY decreased a, a little bit for the BSAI POP, you know, a, a, a bit more for the Gulf of Alaska, but um, kind of more clearly that there's, um, there was more of a change in this F crash rate, you know, the F crash is the, the rate of fishing that would drive the stock to, to zero or to extinction. 
And so you can see that in this part of the graph, things change rather rapidly. And this gets back to this sort of flat top nature of this survival curve. You know, essentially the, the maternal effects don't really kick in, you know, until you get to, you know, some of these high fission rates. Um, so, um, you know, um, I guess one way to look at it is that, you know, you know, may not be, you know, something to worry about until you get to the right hand part of the graph, you know, but another thing to think about too is that, you know, if you have an overfish stock, you know, you're certainly down in this part of the, of the graph. And, and um, if you are in this part of the graph, you know, it could affect your perception of the time it takes to rebuild the stock. So that's something we want to look at for the future. So um, just a couple of thoughts on the mechanics of, of um, looking at this to, to estimate yield curves. One thing we have to do first is to, is to estimate a, a spawn or recruit a risk ship um, and try to get some sense of the productivity of the stock. And there's different ways to do that. We uh, tend to use the Bevern Holt curve on the west coast of the US for uh, most of our non-salmon stocks. And there's a lot of ways to parameterize the curve. And, and um, uh, one particular way I found useful is the concept of steepness. And to me, one advantage of that is, um, is that the, the units are, are, um, are scalable and, and can be compared across not only different stocks of different scales, but also um, different units of SRP. So no matter if, you're, if your units of SQ are in you know, eggs or larvae or spines like biomass, you know, a particular value of steepness kind of means the same things across all cases. So I think that's, that's one advantage. And, um, and another um, kind of useful thing too is that, um, um, you know, one way to define the, the unfished, um, you know, reproductive potential is within the context of, of um, the Beverton Hope curve, you know, so, so um, you know, we can estimate an R0 or recruitment um, that you'd expect, you know, for an unfished situation and convert that into the amount of SRP we would expect for an unfished stock. And this, kind of gets at our, our level of depletion too. So, so depletion again is sort of in scaled units that is somewhat comparable across different situations. So uh, getting into some of the examples here, um, this is the, the first case is the Gulf of Alaska walleye pollock model that Martin Dorn is the lead author on. Um, it's a statistical catch at age model um, as most of our, our um, analytical models in Alaska are. And um, there's many different data types of, that Martin uses, um, but um, for our interest, one of the most important or most interesting ones is this egg production survey. Back in the 1980s and early 90s, um, um, they actually did larval surveys and tried to, to estimate egg production and scale that to, you know, a model independent estimate of SSB. Um, and uh, I think this is our only model in Alaska where we have annual maturity estimates. So the things that people take for granted in other parts of the world are, you know, somewhat unusual in Alaska. And we also have Fikennerty data too, and the, the Fikennerty data is, um, shows that this B exponent is, is greater than one as EJ um, um, found as well. And another point too is that there's, there's a variable size at age, so the spawners are kind of getting bigger over time and this has some interesting interactions. So getting into some of this data. Uh, the top panel here is the age at 50% uh, maturity, shown both by a year, shown in the black lines, and year class, shown in the red lines. And um, you can see that there's, um, it's fairly noisy. There doesn't seem to be an overall trend to the the data. There is a bit of a trend if you look at the L50s or the length of 50% maturity, it seems to be going up, you know, somewhat slightly. And I think one reason for that is the size of the spawners is increasing. So this is the size at age for, um, for um, various ages of, uh, of spawners over time. Um, and we can see it, there's, you know, especially for the, the older fish, you know, it's been some kind of gradual increase, you know, but especially since about 2005, the things have really rapidly increased. So that's a, um, that's a really kind of interesting uh, point. So in terms of SRP, we have a, a number of options. Um, we can use either eggs or spawning stock biomass. And, um, and there's, I, I could see a, a number of different ways to treat the maturity data. Um, the current assessment uses a, simply an average of those um, time varying ogives. But you know, oftentimes we have a case where we only have you know, the maturity data for one year. So we can think about what if we had the year that corresponded to the minimum A50 or 1983 or the year that corresponded to the maximum A50, which is 1991. And then finally, we can actually use the, the time varying, you know, the, the matrix of, um, you know, time varying ogives. Um, so, so the idea here is that if, um, you know, if these time varying ogives are, if they really are signal instead of noise, they should help, help explain this egg production index. You know, the variations in, in uh, maturity should help so explain the variations in, in our egg production index. A second thing we want to look at too is the sensitivity of, um, 
of our output to this uh, fecundity weight exponent. Um, and by output, I mean, you know, a number of things, um, kind of like Sante showed yesterday, the depletion level, our estimates of FMSY, you know, our um, spawn recruiting yield pods, and, you know, the typical standard stuff you get in an assessment. So, in terms of our, our um, kind of first point from a few slides ago, I mean, does this, you know, does incorporation of this type of data really change the way the model fits um, our data? Um, and this actually is eight different plots here. You know, there's eight different definitions of SRP that I'm using, and they all kind of overlay each other. Essentially, the, the, the take home message here is that our estimates of recruitment really are not affected by the choice of, of um, SRP. And the reason for this is because in these, these um, age structured models, um, essentially it's the age and length composition of your data that's determining what the year class strengths are. Um, and um, in fact, many models don't even have a spawn recruit curve in them. Uh, to begin with, I had to add that to Martin's model to, to kind of do my analysis. Um, but, uh, and I did try, um, since the Aberdeen meeting, I tried a number of runs where I dropped out a lot of this data to try to see if that would change the, the uh, estimates of recruitment, and I found that it really didn't, you know, so that, um, I, I suppose I could maybe drop out more data, but I got to a point where the model wasn't converging. But it's maybe something to look at, but, but generally I think it's, you know, the effect on the actual recruitment level is maybe relatively minor. It's not that case for uh, depletion, though. So this is um, the relative depletion, you know, for these eight different measures of, of SRP. And, um, and so the different colors are um, uh, different kind of maturity options. And the dash lines indicate uh, SSP and the solid lines indicate eggs. And I, I've shown kind of with, with um, horizontal lines here, um, you know, depletion levels of 0.4 and, and 0.35, these are kind of critical points in our control rule. At 0.4, we actually, uh, start descending down this, this ramp where we lower fisher mortality. So uh, depending on what um, level of, of, what unit of F SRP that we use, we could cross that, that boundary of 0 0.4 anywhere from 1985 to 1988. And as I think Mark showed yesterday, you know, I mean, if you're sort of on the wrong side of that kink in the curve for, you know, two or three years in a row, that could affect our sort of management performance. This is just the, um, an example of um, some spawn recruit plots, you know, with different measures of, uh, of SRP, this is, uh, both are using eggs, but with two different maturity options. So we can see that we're, you know, again, we're, the recruits are pretty identical. We're kind of moving things in a, um, you know, sort of east-west plane here, uh, changing the relative position on this axis, but not so much done on the y-axis. And we do see a, you know, a, a bit of a change in the, the steepness here. And that gets kind of translated into a, a change in our uh, equilibrium yield curves, you know, for this same example. A point to note here is that, um, in this case, um, looking at the change in, in sort of the way we treat maturity, we're not only seeing a, a change in the F crash rate, but also the F MSY rate. So, um, um, you know, different types of, um, of reproductive biology can affect these curves in different ways. Um, there, there is actually quite a, a range of steepness. Um, I was surprised at, at how big this range was, um, actually. Um, so for these eight different cases then, you know, the steepness ranges is from, you know, 0.45 to 0.67. And um, correspondingly, the FMSY rates sort of scale in the same direction, and they range from 0.12 to, to 0.19. You know, so I, so I guess I, you know, one thing I would say that, given it's, you know, you can get really different results depending on what you use, it, it sort of motivates one to find out, you know, which of these um, eight options is perhaps the best for your stock. Another thing that I found really interesting, too, is that the, um, the time varying maturity really didn't help. Um, in fact, actually, our, our fit to our egg production index was actually degraded uh, very slightly, but it was degraded um, by incorporating time varying maturity. So that's shown down here. Um, you know, the, um, this data point has a you know pretty high um, um, error bar on it, so it doesn't fit it very tightly. You know, but anyway, if you go through the math and compute the you know the likelihood for for this, you know, there is some degradation of the fit. So I think this is a a case that Mark mentioned yesterday. It's not enough to just to have additional data. What you want is um, information or signal. Um, and, and we wouldn't know this generally. And, you know, a lot of stocks don't have this kind of, um, you know, uh, daily egg production estimates. So um, if you just kind of naively um, used this data set as, as truth and went ahead, you know, um, you might be incorporating just noise into your assessment rather than actually signal. So that's, to me, that's a motivation to try to get some of the data to sort of ground truth this within the assessment. Okay, looking at the, the effect of this um, 
this weight um, specific exponent b. So what I did here is I, I um, hopefully I can see this, but um, I um, looked at a variety of options for b ranging from 0.8 to, to 2. So the case of b equals 1 is essentially the same as SSB, and that's shown in the red line here. And it really changes your, your estimate of depletion. You know, things uh, tend to look more depleted, you know, with really high levels of B um, because your, um, your unfair um, spawning stock biomass is, or, or SRP is, is you know, uh, um, so much higher than what it was before. Um, another point here, too, is that there's, you know, there's some increase here at the end, but sort of the, the trajectory of the increase in the end depends on your level of B. And this is, if you recall, there's the, the individual fish are growing quite rapidly in the last, you know, five to eight years or so. You know, so this kind of sort of interacts with this B term, um, and it gets in, you know, this growth kind of gets amplified at really high levels of B. So at B equals uh, two, you kind of come down here and then really rapidly increase. Um, at B equals 0.08, you, you sort of come um, up here and then sort of gradually increase. Um, so anyway, the, you know, our perception of, of, um, of depletion can really be affected at, by this weight-specific exponent, especially when you have these, uh, these kind of trends in individual growth rates. And you can imagine it going the other way, too. Suppose the growth rate is declining, you know, then, um, you know, your, your uh, SRP might be declining more rapidly than you might realize by using just SSB. Um, and um, again, there's um, um, a quite a bit of an impact on the, the uh, steepness in the FMSY rates. This is kind of similar to the the different cases I showed before, you know, um, ranging from, from 0.08 to, to 2, you know, our FMSY rates, um, you know, increased by, by, uh, by quite a bit. It looks like about 50% or so. So the, the second example I want to point out here is my, my own Barron Solution Islands uh, POP model. Um, the actual model code is um, very similar and parts, some parts identical, but there's a lot less data. Um, we just have one abundant index. And we really have no um, information on maturity and fecundity, although we're trying to, to change that. Um, and the, the thing I want to look at here is sort of revisit, revisit, revisit Berkeley's idea of maternal effects and kind of see how it, things compare to what I did four years ago. So here's kind of the update of this plot. It looks very much the same as it did before. But uh, one twist here is that before, when um, um, I don't think I was using eggs. And, and in this case, eggs, you know, it incorporates this B term to be greater than, than um, um, one, so, so if you compare eggs to SSB, we get a really similar result as we got with the, the Pollock example where the FMSY has been um, increases as you move from SSB to eggs. When we now include what I'm calling viable larvae, which incorporates Berkeley's, you know, uh, larval sorrow rate, um, the steepness now increases again, you know, but the FMSY uh, decreases and, and um, the FMSY with viable larvae is almost identical to what it was with uh, swine like biomass. And what's happening here is that, you know, with the B term greater than one, the, the, um, um, the stock is essentially more productive. It's producing more eggs than you would account for with its SSB. You know, with the maternal effects, it's, it's you know, less productive. Um, and so these two terms in this particular taste, you know, somewhat counteract each other. Um, and, and just to, to be clear on this, um, that the fact that they sort of uh, cancel each other out in this particular case is not a, not a suggestion that, that you know, we should not pay attention to this. You know, I think the way I would kind of spin this is that um, the fact that you have these somewhat complex results going in different directions would motivate one to find out, you know, the strength of these kind of things for any particular stock. So this kind of uh, sums up what I um, uh, said a little bit, um, just kind of moving down to the bottom here that, you know, um, some of that, that take home message here is that when, when uh, this B term is greater than one uh, relative to SSB, you know, we would have higher FMS wise. When, um, we use variable larvae with this maternal effect and level survival, then relative to SSB, we have lower FMSYs, and I think this makes sense. You can get fooled a bit if you just look at steepness. Um, I think Sante showed yesterday, and I showed my previous paper, that, you know, sometimes the steepness goes in a counter direction than FMSY. And that, uh, the reason for that is because, um, you know, the, the FMSY takes into account two things. It's not only the spawn recruit curve, but also the, um, the SPR calculations as well. And I think to, to get a true estimate of, of the productivity to stock, I think you have to account for both those things, which the equilibrium yield curve does. Okay, so let's kind of go back to our list and see how we're doing um, in terms of, of whether this kind of data makes a difference. Um, in terms of estimating the abundance of fish by year class, 
Um, there's really, as far as I could see so far, um, somewhat little impact, although we could look at that in more detail. Um, but there's really a, quite a big impact in terms of the way we estimate reference points. And I would suggest that this, this could really influence the way we, we model things. Um, so I think I agree with Mark. At this, this is, I think, kind of the, as far as I can see, sort of the state of the, you know, of my work now. And I think for future studies, we want to see, you know, um, do some management simulation to see how this, these uh, impacts kind of play out over time in terms of management performance. Um, I think I'll skip over this point. I've already talked about like, production surveys, and I would just to sum up here, I um, think it's useful to have those kind of things to kind of ground truth our data. Um, Yvonne Lambert mentioned reproductive value, and I think that's a great idea. Um, it's been mentioned before in the literature and, um, you know, by Lehman and others, and um, it's something that we should definitely look at. It's been noted that it probably checks, you know, um, stock condition better than um, just, uh, spawning stock biomass. Um, and, uh, um, just really quick here, um, another management tool that we've sometimes considered in terms of age structure is closed areas. And so this is from some work that Ed Triple and Sarah Crack and I um, are currently doing. This is part of a, our fresh group. And, um, and you know, um, closed areas have been proposed as one option for maintaining size structure, you know, but um, perhaps a, an effective way to, to uh, reduce this truncation of old ages is simply just efficient FMSY rates. That's what we found with our modeling. So, um, I guess in conclusion, the, you know, I, I see the mechanics as incorporating this stuff um, to be fairly straightforward. I think the difficulty really lies on the data side, not on the modeling side. And for many of the stocks I'm familiar, the, you know, the data just don't provide much information on reproductive biology. So I think we should, we should try to get some of that data and put it into our models. Um, for the Pollock case, you know, the, the time frame maturity didn't help. It was more of a more noise and signal, I would say. Um, and um, and these, these uh, different measures, you know, these different processes can go in in different directions, and it can be sometimes complex to work out how these things work out. You know, so I would say that um, that really motivates us to try to, to take a close look at this stuff and see how it works out for our particular stock. Um, so I think that I think the other points are kind of repeats of what I already said. So I think I'll stop there and see if there's any questions.